Hi, my name is Helena Lucia, and I'm the host of this podcast, Sisu Journey, Science and Stories of Resilience. Today's episode is going to be all about my story of resilience. Initially, the intention of today's episode was going to be a solo record, just me and the microphone telling you my story. However, I was invited to be a guest on my friend Josie's podcast, Firefly and Fern Healing Arts, and I decided to repurpose her episode with her gracious acceptance into my first episode. So on this episode, you'll hear Josie interviewing me for her show. My pronouns are she, her. I live in the state of Washington with my partner, Corey, and we live close by with our five children that we share together in this world and parent together. We love to travel. We love being in the Northwest. We're looking forward to a post COVID world where we can see new places and get to meet new people. But in the meanwhile, I'll be here with my microphone sharing stories from all over the world. Any content or things shared on this podcast are my views solely and not the views of my employer. Also, please note today's episode talks about abuse of many types, including physical, sexual, emotional, spiritual, financial, and coercive control. Also, there's some salty language, so please take care while listening. Okay, so we're recording. I'm here in the virtual landscape with Helena Lucia. Thank you so much for being with me. You're welcome. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. I'm, uh, this is actually my first virtual and I had the pleasure of being on your podcast, Sizu science and, uh, stories of recovery. Um, and that was such an amazing experience. Uh, previous to my interview with you, we had like a little, um, just like a little introduction. Um, Mm -hmm. we were introduced by a mutual friend and, uh, I just got some cliff notes of your story of recovery. And it sounds like at at least for me looking at you, I feel like in many ways, you're like a sponsor or a mentor. Like you're somebody who is just much further down the road in the recovery process and all the things that you've been able to experience. But, um, man, I'd like to kind of go back to those early moments and just kind of hear, hear about who you are, where you come from. So maybe we could just start, start at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate that, but really we're all students and we're all teachers, right? So here we are. Very humble of you. (laughs) So, um, yeah, so I grew up in Minnesota, um, kind of the context that I was born into, um, my mom had moved to Minnesota from Finland at, um, her, in her late twenties to marry my dad. Um, she grew up in a very economically deprived situation in Finland. It was very kind of war torn. Um, when she was growing up, her dad died when she was four. So, um, I have a lot of sympathy and compassion for my mom growing up the youngest in a family of, I believe 10, um, Mm -hmm. and, and then coming to the U S and, and, you know, kind of learning the ropes, so to speak. And then she ended up unexpectedly, she had been pretty sick as a child, I think mostly because of their poverty situation, you know, but, um, she didn't really expect to have children and she ended up having, um, when I was born in 75, I was number six and she, and my oldest sister was in kindergarten that year. So she really got, uh, deluged with the children. (laughs) And so the religion that, um, I was born into, um, or the religion that my parents were in prior to my birth was, is called old apostolic Lutheran church. And it's, um, it comes from Finland, Sweden, and Norway. It's a, it's a Nordic, um, kind of fundamentalist religion. Um, that's very extreme, but my parents actually left the old apostolic church, um, with a group of my family members the year that I was born. So during my in utero process, um, 
there was this huge trauma right in our families because my mom was leaving the church of her family, you know, leaving that religion meant leaving God, basically leaving, going, you know, either side of the other thought the others were going to hell. Right. But my grandfather had been a pastor in or a preacher, they call them in that church. And there was some bad blood among some people. And so my dad's family all kind of split off and became this smaller, you know, a couple hundred people this smaller sect that was even more conservative than the religion that they, from once they had left. So the way that I grew up was just extreme. I mean, there was no TV, no media, no radio, no music, no musical instruments, no dancing, no, um, we could not wear pants, you know, just like a lot of rules and growing up in Minnesota where it's frigid in the winter time, not wearing pants is unpleasant. So, um, so yeah, that was kind of the, you know, the religion that I was born into. Um, and our household growing up was very chaotic. Um, my dad has uh, major anger issues. I guess that would be one way to put it. Um, he was also a preacher in the church. So um, he and, um, and my grandfather, and my great uncle were all preachers and there was just kind of this this system of patriarchy and oppression and misogyny and that was just kind of that was the landscape having such um an extreme childhood and being it seems like so isolated and so um removed from any other outside experiences, did you know things were different? Was there an inkling of like, oh, there's other, other religions, there's other experiences? Well, yeah. yeah, so I mean, one kind of saving grace, I guess, was that my family did not homeschool. So I wasn't entirely isolated what, as far as going to school. I would went to school with others. I participated in, you know, um, some activities, although we couldn't do sports or drama or anything like that. I mean, we, I did like math league and, you know, some of the other more nerdy pursuits, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think I did know that other people had different religions. There was a girl in my class that was Jehovah's witness. I knew she couldn't do Christmas. Um, we couldn't really, we didn't exchange, exchange Christmas presents or anything either. So I could kind of relate with that a little bit. I, I remember my principal died when I was in like fifth grade. He died of an accident. It was very sad and very tragic. And we went to um, his service and my, that was the first time I'd heard the hymn nearer my God to thee. Mm. And I remember it kind of blowing my mind because it was just like, I just couldn't rationalize in my, you know, young brain that it was like this gorgeous music was like evil and of the world and that my principal had now, you know, died and gone to hell because he didn't like believe in our little tiny religion. So I, I, I did have questions about that. And then I had a couple cousins that suddenly died. Um, they were struck by cars when, I, you know, between the ages of like 11 and 13. And I, and I always just wondered, like my cousin had nail polish in her purse and it's such a silly thing now looking back, but I was just like, oh, so scandalous that she died with nail polish in her purse. And like, what does that mean? You know? And so, yeah, I really had the fear of God put in me for sure. Oh my gosh. Over nail polish. Oh. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. That yeah. is so radical and, and, and just a very extreme way. Um, I'm curious, like, as you grew up and you got into your, um, your teen years, um, what was it like to have the idea of like, Oh, I'm growing up into this. Did you, was there resistance? Was there something, a voice inside? Was there always um, 
something else for you or were you completely bought in because you grew up in it? I think I was, so I think I was bought in um, at a younger age. I I think I was always kind of a good girl. So I always Mm kind of wanted to do the right thing and, you know, make people proud. Although that was like a big fat sin to the pride part. But um, when I was going into my teenage years, I had some really um, bad traumatic events happen to me, some sexual abuse and things. Mm -hmm. And I, I really, and then I had um, several deaths, like I mentioned, happen within a short period of time. And so I was pretty um, dissociated going into those years. I have like very few, like really concrete memories of several, several years. So I, I really can't say um, what my feeling was with respect to the church for, for that time. I do know as a teenager, I, I was always very logical, very, very analytical and very logical. And that was one of the things that got me into trouble quite a bit because I liked to, asking questions that did not logically line up. And, um, you know, these things do not logically line up. So it, I, making sense out of it was just impossible. But um, one thing that I realized was that if I should desire to get married, which I did, I wanted to get married and have kids. Um, and um, our little religion was only my cousins and second cousins. So, you know, that was kind of off the table as far as getting married um, to those folks, although some people in the church definitely did marry second cousins. Um, I decided to start going to church with my friend, Jill, who, th- who was going to the old apostolic church, which is the church that my family had left. So going back to that church as a teenager, um, I kind of did this just logic in my mind. And I was like, if it's either one or the other, which is kind of how I had been raised, really kind of this, this dichotomy, um, it makes, it makes sense to me that it would be the larger one, right? Because it wasn't like these little small group of people were doing anything that different from those people over there. Yeah, maybe they, the people over there parted their hair differently or sometimes cut bangs, God forbid. But it wasn't really that different. It was pretty much the same. So I started kind of going there. And it was really logic that took me there. Then when I got to the other church, I found that I had like a whole reputa- family reputation to live up to. Like I had to prove that I was different than all of those people that had left. So, you know, that was kind of a challenge, I guess. Um, and I didn't really, I guess I didn't really suffer that much with this new religion. So I kind of just made it work for me for a time. Um, I got married into it when I was 19. And then I moved here to Washington, which is where I live now. And the, the, the group here in Washington is much more insular than the one in Minneapolis. The one in Minneapolis, people were um, separated, you know, as far as where they live, geographically separated, you know, usually be about a half an hour to drive to someone's house or more. And in Washington, they were just all clustered together. So they really, it really was your church community is your social community is everything is anybody you would ever call to do anything. And most of the people here really don't even associate much with anyone outside of the church. And so the culture was so narrow minded And so, um, so exclusive and the kids, there was just a lot of bullying at the school. So I had had four kids by the time I was 25 and here I was just completely exhausted. My thyroid wasn't working correctly. My husband was a jerk. Like he was, he, you know, he would come home and just like, what did you do all day? You know, that kind of thing. I mean, it was just I went like from the frying pan into the fire and I just had this, um, just this, this overwhelming life where I was taking care of these kids. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I would wake up and then I would just be exhausted and be waiting for them to go to sleep so I could sleep. And 
you know, just kind of treading water, I guess I kind of recreated the life my mom had because I had moved away from, from, you know, my family of origin um, without much of a support network there anyway, and then moved into this situation where, um, yeah, I had this angry man that I was living with and all of these kids to take care of. What was that like? Did you, did you realize that in the moment, like realize, oh my gosh, I don't have the support, um, kind of that you were almost recreating and almost a carbon copy or was it all still kind of under the surface? Oh no. I just sort of realized that just now as we were talking. (laughs) (laughs) Really? Oh, wow. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, so I had, you know, four kids I had started, I had, I never kind of subscribed to the idea that I didn't have associate with anybody outside of the religion. I just hadn't grown up that way and it didn't, it didn't really work for me. So I was like friendly with my neighbors and, um, you know, I, I tried getting jobs here and there outside of the home. And so I had this one neighbor, um, her name was Tammy, and we used to take walks together all the time. And she was a, she's a a Christian. And we would often, she would ask me questions about the religion, um, probably pointed questions now looking back, you know, but I didn't really think about it. And then she would say, oh, that's, you know, hmm, that's not really what it says in the Bible, you know, stuff like that. Just kind of reminder. And I had read the Bible growing up. But the thing about that church is that they teach you that you can't really understand the Bible, that you need the preachers to like elucidate it for you. So I, it was very confusing. That makes it really crazy in your head. You know, it's kind of a little bit of gaslighting. Yeah. Um, Oh, absolutely. And then when they do explain the Bible, they make it all into this allegory. So it's like this, you know, like. Like it's like every word, you know, symbolizes something else. So you really can't understand it because you have to like know what the meaning of is, is right. So, so yeah, so I won. So I did decide to just read it at some point because I was like this, you know, something didn't felt off, I guess. And at one point I was reading it and I was just like, it was like a light bulb. I was like, oh. This is just written in plain language for anyone who reads it and wants to understand it. Like it's not, it's not, it's just a book, which also may not feel like a light bulb moment to some, but it was to me because that was, you know, was contrary to what I'd been told. And from that moment on, I just started to see like, oh, this is crazy. And um, I think I just kind of kept that in my pocket for probably about a year before I even said anything to my husband. Um, And just kind of observed, quietly observed and and observed conversations that I had um, and realized that I would have to lie to be in the conversation, you know, not in order to... um, in order to not like blow my cover. And so I think the process of leaving the religion took maybe a year and a half. Um, Eventually I told him, he was very angry, but asked me to just not tell anyone and keep going. Basically um, didn't really care like what was going on in my head and heart, just as long as I showed up and uh, went through the motions, which is, you know, pretty, pretty um, common, I think, for those types of religions, because it's all about the appearances and not really about what's inside. Especially with such a tight knit community. Exactly. It's all about saving face. Exactly. And that's what made it possible for me to do that, because the cost is too high of leaving. Because even though you hope in your mind that your friendships are going to be strong enough to survive it and that maybe your friends are different. Um, That's pretty rare from what I've heard of people who have left um, that they are able to preserve the relationships. 
even if you are able to preserve the relationships, they're not transparent, honest, thoroughly open relationships. Um, but yes, yeah, so eventually um, 2001, it was August of 2001, two months before, well, right before September 11th, I guess. Um, I just left. I just told him I wasn't going to do it anymore. I couldn't pretend. I wasn't going to lie about my beliefs in conversations. I wasn't going to pretend um, to believe what other people were believed. And frankly, I was kind of irritated with the, the boundary violations that kept on going on. You know, people felt like they could ask you like, why you have internet, do you need it for work or um, things like that, you know, or if you're on birth control, you know, stuff like that, like it's just, there's no boundaries whatsoever. And I was just kind of pissed off about that at that point. Um, so I did leave in 2001 and yeah, that was a pretty, pretty big deal. And then all of a sudden, six months later, he decided that I was right and he left too. I guess his decision to leave was just kind of supposed to erase all of the cruelty and whatever that had come up to that point. Mm -hmm. And so after that, um, we kind of started attending some like kind of fundamentalist uh, Christian churches in the area, non-denominational Christian churches in the area. And so we kind of tried that on for a while. Um, and I think it worked for me for, for that time because I needed community um, that I was missing from, from leaving the Apostolic Lutheran Church. Gosh, there's so much there, Helena. Oh my gosh. Um, I imagine leading up to 2001, there was a lot of that anticipatory grief. Here you are participating in re relationships and friendships that mm -hmm. were not fulfilling. Most um, definitely. And so um, going from that, did you know that you were going to leave? I think I did. I think I, I, knew, I think I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do this forever. Um, and the anticipatory grief, I think some of the, some of the issues were um, that I did have really deep friendships with some of my um, girlfriends that had, especially people who had also been transplants to the area mm. um, that kind of felt a little bit, you know, it was like the weirdos club or whatever. We we're a little bit, you know, the misfits. And, um, and so in some ways our relationships were really deep and, and I recognized that it would, everything would change. And also when you leave, you're, you're barraged with all of these people who want to change your mind and want to convince you otherwise, and want to have all these conversations about um, what you believe. And you're just not strong enough to do all of that. I remember someone told me, you know, just close your door and don't answer your door and don't answer your phone. And, you know, that felt such like such a foreign way to be, but it's kind of what you have to do is just create your boundaries and, 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 and let your, your fragile little heart heal, you know? Yeah. That is such a stark contrast. That is like the amount of growth to implement that those boundaries mm -hmm. in such a short amount of time really takes that almost like a psychotic break of like, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. And it's almost impossible. I mean, being raised and steeped in, to, in that kind of um, just not having any limits to, you know, know where you, st you end and someone else starts, you know, yeah. and then all of a sudden to be expected to be able to do that in a healthy way is, is unrealistic, but yeah, I mean, I did my best and here I am. Yeah. That's a, that's such a big gap because, oh my gosh, you are so experienced with things that are, wouldn't even be on your radar back in the early two thousands. Mm -hmm. Um, so can you take me along that journey? You know, what was it like? I'm curious also from your kid's point of view, what was, what was it like? What did you see them going through as you decided to kind of make this separation and, um, yeah, just step out for yourself. 
Yeah, so um, let's see that it was 2001. So Kelly would have been about six at that time. And so they were all between six and then Kayla was born in um, December after I left. So she was, I was wow. pregnant with her when I left. Wow. So again, there we yes. go. Like for her recreating that whole wow. separation. Um, so I think that for them, the challenge was a relational as well. So we were still living in battleground, which is the area where there's a, you know, 80% of the people really are, you know, somewhere around that are in that religion. So it's a very, very um, saturated. And then also uh, battleground is an area with a lot of kind of exclusive religions in addition to that too. So there it's, it's a very interesting little part of our county here. Um, so they got a lot of backlash at school and at family events, you know, for wearing earrings or um, whatever kind of things. Um, they went to school. I remember one time um, I went along on a school field trip and one of the kids um, had said to Jana that you used to be a Christian, but now you're a worldly. That's what they call oh, people. Oh yeah. So and that word too, worldly, that always cracks us up because um, when I got together with Corey, my partner, he mentioned that worldly is like a compliment, but to us, it was like a major slight. You know, if you said someone was a worldly, like that was basically sending them to hell. But so now, like when we get in and when we go to a hotel or something and I know how to use like a weird key card or something, Corey's like, ah, oh, you're so worldly, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so reframed, reframed to that one. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think it was difficult for all of us. I mean, there was still major anger issues going on in our household. Um, so my kids were really kind of growing up with the childhood that I had. Um, with their dad, even though we weren't going to that church anymore. Um, we were still going to the other church. The one thing that I noticed was people who had left, had also left the church, really wanted ours to be this big success story because it wasn't very common that both partners in a marriage would leave the church. And so they really wanted, they really had a vested interest in our marriage surviving and, and, you know, everyone um, it working out for everyone. But as I started going to therapy, um, I think I started therapy somewhere around 2005. Um, and I had always wanted to go to therapy. That's another thing that was a little bit different than some of the other folks in the church, because we didn't really have, we didn't really consider therapy as like a, a great option. I mean, there was always a lot of like, well, a therapist is going to, you know, turn you liberal or like make your brain, you know, get too educated or, you know, some crazy shit that would just basically the therapist is going to make you realize that your religion and your relationships are unhealthy. Right. So I started going to therapy in around 2005. I really, things came to a head. I really needed to deal with my sexual abuse, trauma, and, you know, just, um, a lot of the issues that, um, that I've been dealing with since, childhood just kind of were coming to a head and I just didn't, didn't feel good in my own skin. I didn't, I, I didn't have um, joy or peace or happiness or any of the good things that you, you know, want to have. Um, and so I started therapy and the first time I went to therapy, um, I, um, described my situation to my therapist or I described my life story. And I was just like, here it is in a nutshell. And I was going to run through it real quick, you know, 15 minute synopsis. And then like, let's do this in two weeks and wash my hands of this. Right. And I looked up and she was crying. And I was like, why is she crying? <laughs> like, I'm not crying. Why is she crying? And she was like, you really don't spend very much time in your body. Do you? And I was like, what is she talking about? I had no idea what she was talking about. 
none. And, um, and I've since learned what she meant and she was absolutely right. And, um, and that was 2005 and, uh, I still see her. So <laughs> I guess it wasn't a quick two week fix or upper, um, but I have taken some breaks. So, so I did end up, um, leaving my marriage. Oh yeah. The other thing about that first session, I told her, um, I was telling her about my childhood growing up and I said, and my dad's a bully. And I was almost shaking because I was so nervous. My husband was going to find out that I was at therapy. And I told her that, that I like, I couldn't mm. tell him. And she's like, well, is your husband a bully? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I think he is a bully. <laughs> so it's just like all of those parallels, you know, you don't really realize, um, until you're, until someone tells you, speaks the truth into your life. And that was the interesting thing too, is being in the Christian community at that time, I would tell other people what was going on in my life, in my relationship, kind of to see if it was okay. And no one ever really said, oh, absolutely not. He should not talk to you that way. You know, that is not okay. No one said that. So I really didn't have a frame of reference for figuring out like what was okay. Yeah. It shows also just the inherent trauma in some of those communities, yeah. not mm -hmm. all of it, but like the, just sometimes the, the foundation of understanding is mm -hmm. not based off of true mutual respect and, and the, the type of divine love that mm -hmm. is sought after. Um, yeah. I'm curious how going back to your therapist, going back to that first session, I guess I have two questions. How did you find your therapist and you, you went secretively and what was it like for you to finally have that safe space? I mean, it definitely rocked you seeing her cry and yeah, I imagine there was so much more there. Yeah. So the way that I found her the realization that I even needed therapy was I had found this book. Um, it was on healing sexual abuse. I can't remember what it's called. I think the wounded heart or something like that. It was a Christian based book, but it was very good. And I had a friend um, that I went to church with and we were going to go through the book, just the two of us together, just do a book study. we had both had, you know, sexual trauma and we started doing it and I just like hit the skids and I couldn't like, as you know, uncovering that stuff without having a guide is just like not recommended. And I couldn't, you know, I, I just couldn't really function. And so she, um, then this friend told me that she had heard about a therapist um, here in the Portland area that is actually doing a group based on the book. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll try the book. I'll try the group. And then when I signed up for the group, I also found out that they wisely require you to be on, in one-on-one -on -one therapy as well. Um, so that was how I found her is that she was the one that was doing this group based on that. And looking back now on that too, I realized how fortunate I was because I cannot tell you how many friends have tried to go to therapy and their therapists have been just garbage, just complete shit. And so I, I, I just got lucky. I found, um, found Mary Jane and she's my person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it just sounds like magic, like, um, divinely inspired. So going back to that first session, it seems almost like like just that you were carving out this mm -hmm. new life for yourself. It was a little bit of a secret, but you, it was, um, it had to be protected. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had always been the person who goes and buys all the self-help books or like checks them out from the library to try to figure out like how I can, you know, get to the bottom of this thing that I'm dealing with or, you know, figure this stuff out. This was way well before YouTube. That's your logic right there, huh? Yeah. So I think that that's why I want, always wanted to go to therapy because I was like, well, I mean, God, there's got to be a way to fix this shit, right? 
only way to do it is to do it in community. We can't mm-hmm. do this shit alone. Yeah. Yeah. That's a scary thing too. When you're um, dealing with your shame and your, um, you know, I remember early on when, and when I was in group and stuff and they were like, you have to do this in relationship. And I was like, oh, fuck. Mm. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Yeah. So you're doing the one-on-one and did you do the book study as well? Uh And what was, what was that like with the, with the group? The group was really cool. Um, I, uh, I learned a lot about the ways that we learn to cope um, and was able to see that that mirrored in other people. Right. So there's like, I was the good girl archetype, but then there were others in the group who were the party girl or the forgot what the others were, you know, the, the bad girl or what, you know, whatever, like the other archetypes were. And so bringing that stuff out was really powerful. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a huge time of learning for me. We also did an experiential learning, um, thing where we went to a challenge course. I don't know if you've ever done like the ropes courses or anything. Um, no, but experiential learning meaning is more somatic based, like it's get, getting you into your body. Yeah. So when you do the ropes courses and I wish there were more of them available, the one that we went to is actually not even a ropes course anymore, as far as I know, but, um, you do events. Um, so yeah, it is, it, you're, in, you are in your body you you do events as a group and the events kind of bring out your ways of relating in a way that you can't just like ask questions and get answers to. And so they they could be like trust exercises or goal setting or whatever. And so there was therapists that were doing the events in addition to my therapist. Um, and they were, they would ask questions like, Oh, where else in your life? Don't you set goals? And it was really like the, some of the, some of the breakthroughs that I had during that um, weekend, like changed my life forever. I mean, I think that they like gave me the courage and tenacity and stuff to, to even just be here right now. So that it was, the, the group was really powerful. And then obviously combined with individual therapy and I continued to see Mary Jane for a while. And then eventually through that, I realized that my marriage was not serving me. Um, And so I decided to leave that um, permanently in 2007. And then we were divorced in 2009. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, that is an intense couple of years starting in 2001 and left the church 2005 getting into therapy and getting into a whole nother realm of community mm-hmm. where the community that you grew up with was so repressive and so mm-hmm. extremist this was totally different yeah and this 2007 so 2007 when I left my ex-husband, um, that was another separation of community then because all of the people that I had been around in these, um, Christian communities, including other people who had left the old apostolic church, other people who had left other apostolic Lutheran congregations who we were starting to like congregate with and be friends with. And then all of the people that we'd met through the Christian community, um, they all, felt like I was, you know, violating my oath to God or whatever by leaving my marriage. And I basically, you know, I had a second separation at that time of all of those people who did not stand by me. And and a lot of it has to do with my ex-husband really worked hard to let people know that he was in the right and I was in the wrong and he wanted to make it work. And I, you know, was the baddie who who was following the devil. Right. And so, yeah, I had, that was a rough time because my family of origin, um, had a lot of, a lot of negative things to say. I didn't have any money. I mean, I, 
I was working at, as a financial advisor at a credit union, making next to nothing um, and uh, trying to, you know, I didn't have enough money for a lawyer. So I got like 400 bucks a month child support. I mean, it was just insane. Um, so that was, that was a pretty, pretty dark time for me emotionally. I mean, that right there, that, that really explains where, um, your latest project comes through that resiliency, because going from that to getting yourself back in a school, mm -hmm. I mean, when, when did you go back to school? Yeah. So I started, um, going back to college in 2010, I think. Yeah, 2010. I graduated in 2014. So, yeah. And, and what did you pursue? I mean, I, I can't imagine going back to college on that level with four kids and juggling everything that you did. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, I was working at the credit union and I'd always wanted to work in, in um, tech somehow because I, always felt like I was pretty good at it. I mean, even with all of our limitations growing up, my dad, we did have a computer in our house because my dad worked in tech. And, um, you know, over the years, I just seemed to be able to understand computers. Um, and even in working at the credit union, often people would have issues with their email or something. And our tech support was up in Olympia. So they would just come to me and ask me for help with their with their issues. So I was thinking about, actually it was, um, you know, that girl on criminal minds, uh, Penelope, oh, <laughs> that I'm... she was so great. And so she was like trying to figure out, I mean, she was kind of like a hacker type or whatever. And I was like, Oh, maybe I should go into forensics and work in, um, work in, work in computers. So I, um, looked at the programs in the area and, Washington State University campus here has a computer science program. That's their only really tech tech program. So I thought, well, that seems like a good choice, but I couldn't do it and keep my job. I had to quit my job. Um, I guess it's a silver lining because there's no way I could have worked and done that at the same time. I mean, I had enough on my plate. So I took... Um, what I, the money that I had from splitting my ex-husband's 401k and I took whatever I could get from financial aid. And I just like walked off the cliff and started school full time. <laughs> oh my gosh. You jumped the, the chasm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because I had, I was working at the credit union. I, I don't know if I've I have never shared this story, but it, there's nothing that can be done about it now. I wanted to get my, I wanted to get my 401k match, which meant I had to be employed on the last day of the year. But my school started on January 5th. But I knew that if I put in a two week notice at the credit union and they didn't keep me for two weeks, they had to pay me for two weeks. And I kind of gambled that they weren't going to keep me for two weeks because they would um, not want me to talk to my clients about leaving. Oh yeah. So I waited till January 1st so I could get my 401k match and put in my notice. And fortunately they didn't call my bluff. They let me go. <laughs> nice gamble. I know. <laughs> so there's that logic. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I went back to school. Um, I went, I, um, I, I, learned how to program computers and found out that I loved it. I mean, it was, um, it was very stressful. Of course, I spent a lot of time um, and volleyball games doing homework. I did pulled a lot of all nighters, um, you know, got a lot of assignments kind of turned in late, uh, but I made it. I, I got through it and I was really glad that I did because it was, maybe one of the first things that I had started and completed, um, you know, that was really hard. So, um, 
throughout that, I did some internships. I um, started dating um, and I met my partner, Corey. We met in 2011. And it was, you know, at first when I thought about dating when I was in school, I thought, how would I even have time to, to, you know, have a relationship and be in school? But by the end of it, I was like, how would I have not made it through school without having a supportive partner? Hmm. Um, and so that was a really, a really big deal to meet someone who was healthy emotionally and who could hold space for all of my drama and trauma and kids and messiness and, and, um, and that, all of that. So that has been, you know, a, one of the most beautiful experiences in my life. Oh man. That's such a happy story. Um, but you have done some deep work aside from getting back into school, you've had Mary Jane and you've continued to go deeper mm -hmm. and deeper into this, the religious trauma and to some of the other traumas, mm -hmm. the, some of the sexual abuse. And yeah, so I've, I've really only been seeing Mary Jane again for the last few years. I, um, she had, well, when I was, you know, out, right out of, um, out of my marriage, I obviously didn't have any money to be doing yeah. anything. Um, and then a few years ago, I was really struggling a lot and things were coming back up and are, you know, in, in life as they do when life slows down and kind of things settle, then stuff starts bubbling up to the surface. So I started seeing another therapist. I really wanted to get EMDR because I knew EMDR had been so powerful working with Mary Jane with it in the past. And so I looked to see around here who was teaching EMDR. I was a little resistant to seeing Mary Jane because she had been a Christian therapist um, when I was a Christian and which worked out really well then. But in my space at the time, I just really didn't want to deal with any of that stuff. Um, I was, it was, uh, more like anti, anti God at that point. <laughs> um, and so I found this other therapist here in Vancouver and, um, started seeing her and her process for doing EMDR was just so different. Um, it was just really, um, really formulaic. And she didn't seem to like get me. She didn't laugh at any of my jokes. I mean, not that that's that important, but I'm pretty fucking funny. Yeah. So, <laughs> so then I was just, so I, one time I brought Corey with me and he kind of like watched the interaction and we left there and he's like, you know, it's a real shame. She just doesn't really seem to get you. Mm. And I said, yeah, I wish you'd have met Mary Jane. And he's like, well, where is she now? And I said, she moved to the East Coast. I don't know. And he's like, well, look her up. So we did. And she was back in Portland. So I, um, I called her up and it was great. It's been great seeing her again. Now I see her once a month and we do some EMDR and actually going to see her again in an hour. Oh, oh, yay. Oh, that is awesome. Um, yeah. Um, can I say that we met each other through Mary Jane? Okay. I yes. just want to, okay, okay, cool. Cause yeah, she is a, a rare breed of person and she is somebody who has really done her own work. Mm -hmm. And, yep. um, that's a lot of what I see and what I'm so attracted to in you as well. It's like this willingness to just dive head first into it and not, I mean, I don't know you bef from before, like we've only known each other very recently in this period of our lives, but, um, yeah, what you, what you've shared with me of what you've implemented in your life of just really doing things at a top notch level with reverence and, uh, ultimate respect um, I, I mean, it's rare. That's all I have to say. It's just really rare. Um, and so did you go right back into EMDR? Um, and 
I want to, I want to be respectful of time. So, oh, yeah. but, um, but I also want to get to a lot of the other modalities that you're doing more recently. So what's the path into that? Yeah. So, so I actually did do another group again. Um, I, we used the sexual healing journey book this time. That was good, but I just wasn't really making as much momentum um, and progress as I, you know, I think the talk therapy and stuff was really important earlier on when I didn't have any awareness of boundaries and family systems and what was going on and, and had to make sense of it all cognitively. Right. But mm-hmm. I just reached a point where my nervous system was in such a hot mess and the, um, the prefrontal cortex stuff wasn't doing it. So I needed to deal with, um, the body brain connection, which as I, as I know now is a, about 80% of it. So 20% of your yeah. nervous system stuff is bo- brain to body and 80% is body to brain. Um, so I started trying to attack some other modalities. So I did some hypnotherapy um, to deal with the subconscious stuff. Um, I did. I started working with plant medicine guide um, to do some psychedelic work. Um, so that's been really instrumental for me. Um, I've done. So that was at the beginning of 2020 that I started um, using this, doing the psychedelic therapy. And that was really couched with a lot of integration work before and after. Yes. Um, so I was, I'm, you know, working with a psychedelic integration coach and we do EFT, which is the tapping emotional freedom um, techniques to, um, to work with bringing all the parts of myself into cohesion Um, approaching them with compassion and, um, and love, and then really doing some of the very intense fundamental building block stuff using the psychedelics. Um, the, the ones that I've done so far have been, um, I've done three psilocybin journeys and then one MDMA, um, journey, and they've all been hugely impactful in my life. What was that first psychedelic journey like? Because I mean, that is to go from the, the very, um, as you, as you put it, the cognitive therapy, like that, that realm, but getting back into the body, dropping into the body. Um, there's nothing like psychedelics to bring you back into your body and, and make you aware. Yeah, I think the first journey was really kind of a, you know, breaking the ice type situation, so to speak. Like I, I feel, I I remember having some moments of fear. It was just kind of a way to just show me what there was to do, show me the work that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. and um and bring me to the edge and the edge at that time was not as far as it was you know not as not as much movement as it was in some of the further journeys so the second and third um psilocybin journey I kind of like dropped right into it and just started doing my grief work and remembering and processing and remembering and processing and building a foundation. Um, The second journey was very profound because at the time I had been struggling with, um, with, you know, really just a pattern of using alcohol to regulate my nervous system. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of causing a lot. I was having a lot of physical problems anyway. And so it was causing more, um, more uh, load to my body. And I, my, I had gotten back some tests that showed up that my liver enzymes were elevated. So I really wanted to take a break from drinking. And I had been really successful doing that previously, but for whatever reason, I just was not having, um, well, I understand the reason now it was just because I was, my nervous system was so you know, it's in such disarray. And whenever you put stress on that, 
then you're going to use your coping mechanisms and alcohol was a coping mechanism and Major. alcohol was causing stress to my nervous system. So it was just this big loop. And, um, you know, it was really causing Corey to have a lot of pain. Corey's my partner. Um, you know, because first of all, I'm disappearing into the alcohol and then I'm disappearing in other ways. And then my body's not working right. And, and, you know, what's he going to do if like, I just keep doing this. Yeah. And so, um, this, during the second journey, I really connected with that pain that he was feeling. Uh, first of all, I really missed him so much. I just wanted him to be there so badly. And then I really felt that grief that he was feeling and that how badly that pain would be for him if I just wasn't here anymore. Mm. And if I just kept on this track and it was a, just a few days after that, that um, trip that I read this naked mind and just have not had a drink since. So, um, so that's pretty huge. Um, you know, a lot of like huge growth in that trip. Also, I was able, I've learned to find my voice during um, using psychedelic work. So that was um, after I just had this whole time where I was sobbing and crying and missing him so much, I actually called him and asked him to come there. And that was a big deal because I haven't been, I've been the shrinking violet, right? I've been the person who makes my needs really small and doesn't ask for anybody to be put out. And it was kind of a big deal because he had his son. So he had to have someone watch him and then come there and be with me. But um, the guide that I was, you know, there with told me that learning to ask for your needs and for other people, like again, relationship and co-regulation and all of that, doing your own work alone isn't going to work. We have to do our own work in relationship. And I had to, had to ask for that. And that has been really powerful. Like I have a void filled now after that experience that I never had filled in my life. So there's like some really foundational building blocks that I've been able to build up again um, with psychedelic therapy and I don't know how or how many years of other type of therapy that it would take to actually do that, or if it's even possible in another realm. What was it like to do that in a, um, in an environment that although it Portland is in the Pacific Northwest is very welcoming. Um, it's not, it, it's it's not exactly legal yet, you know, or at sure. the time, you know, like you're, mm -hmm. you're breaking these thresholds, but you know, by crossing the line, you kind of almost redefine in your mind where that line actually is for yourself. Um, it's definitely a little bit different talking about it on a platform like this, but I think it has to be talked about. I think people need yeah. to understand that these tools are out there and they're very powerful and they should be respected and that they should be done in their um, respected container. Like if I had done these, tried doing this work on my own without a guide, um, we'd be having a whole different conversation right now. And I, my nervous system would probably be worse off than when I started. That's such an important point. The preparation, you know, and, and you were talking about kind of sandwiching it in that integration and mm -hmm. having that, the guide, and then also having your therapist mm -hmm. and having, um, so many other modalities to be able to go back into your body and really continue to mm -hmm. connect things. Uh, I mean, go yeah, ahead. And my daily practice of meditation and self-compassion, yes. you know, learning how to sit in my body and, and, you know, allow feelings to move through me and not having attachment to my feelings and all of these other pieces um, have been really important for me to do this work um, so quickly. And I say so quickly, but sometimes it just takes like, it feels like it's taking forever. <laughs> 
But just like the growth, uh, the growth that's there. I mean, healing is spiralic and things always come around and sure. you always go a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. So there's more yet to come, but, um, you mentioned the importance of having that, that ritual and having that practice mm-hmm. can take me into that a little bit. What does that look like for you? What's yeah. important for you to, to stay connected and grounded? So right now I'm working on some different things than I have been working on in the past, but so it really depends on the day, but I mean, most days now I'm working a lot on my creativity and my freedom of expression and my voice. So I'll come into my office and, you know, turn on my music. Um, I really like the Sami music um, of my heritage. So I'll, you know, listen to that. I'll dance, I'll journal, you know, do um, morning pages is, is a thing that's coined by Julia Cameron who wrote The Artist's Way, but that um, is just really about kind of uncluttering your brain by just writing three pages of just whatever comes to mind, like stream of consciousness when you first thing when you wake up, just kind of clearing out the cobwebs and, and removing any creative blocks. Um, So I do movement, Um, you know, sometimes it's yoga, sometimes it's dancing, sometimes it's both. Um, I have a, you know, I I meditate um, often before I get out of bed or after I get up, um, you know, and when I'm falling asleep, um, I'll do, sometimes I listen to a guided meditation or a hypnosis um, that I have on my phone, but otherwise I'll just, um, I often just meditate, you know, on my own. And then, um, I have, I do, um, an offering of fire to spirit and an offering of water to my ancestors and invite those who want, um, come with unconditional love and want my higher good to be present with me. Um, the day and then I'll do some reading I'll sometimes uh, more often than not I'll do gratitude practice and I um, I have a little setup here with you know just like little tokens of things that I'm grateful for and just do a gratitude practice and um, I'll often read a page out of the Tao and um, just kind of sets the tone for my day and those are my rituals um I use essential oils um, for, because I feel like all the senses, you know, a sensory experience to have um, ritual. So I'll often open my window to get some air, um, add some oils to get some fragrance. I'll make some hot lemon water with collagen in it for my protein. And, and that, you know, just kind of hits all of the senses. So yeah, that's my ritual. Mm. What is your relationship with your ancestors and with your, your God or your spirit now? Well, so I, you know, I spent a lot of years just kind of being a pretty much of an atheist, um, you know, as far as just being kind of a concrete engineer, but I kind of started to see a lot of, I just saw, like you said earlier, like, it seems like that was kind of divinely inspired, you know, kind of the, these different, I just have had a lot of that in my life. Um, and recently I watched, it was on Netflix, it's called surviving death. And I I realized that I don't really not believe in God. (laughs) So I'm, I'm not, to answer your question, I'm not sure I am Mm. open, um, now, whereas I would haven't been in the past, um, I often use like the universe or whatever as Mm -hmm. the kind of term. Um, I am interested in doing, what is it called? The dose of, um, what's like the threshold dose or something where you actually, actually find out. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Heroes, um, heroic dose. Yeah. So I might try that sometime, but. Um, five grams five grams yeah it's a lot dark Terrence McKenna (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's a lot so yeah um so does that answer your question 
Yeah, I, I'm just curious because it, I mean, it's just such a beautiful connected practice. You know, it seems like um, more than going to a church and letting a community be your higher power or going and letting, letting um, some authorities, you know, mm-hmm. pastors be able to tell you what you believe, right? You're, you're letting this information come through you. And that's, I think the interesting thing about the, the ancestor work and, and your connection, you know, going back to, and what I'd like to maybe pivot to is your, your current practice and now or your current uh, project rather, yeah. uh, your podcast project, you know, yeah. that is such an expression of letting that, um, almost like healing some of these patterns and the, I mean, you're a science person, you probably know all about epigenetics and, mm-hmm. and repeat, you know, the, how we recreate trauma and how these things actually change our, change our gene expression and, mm-hmm. and it affects our health, it affects our mental health and, you know, all of it. And I think connecting with ancestors and recognizing and having a, um, like a, a, a tool of discernment, that, that ability of discernment that really only comes from solitude. It comes from that continuity that um, the, the practice that you just mentioned, your morning ritual, um, you're making yourself a home for all of that. And I just think it's beautiful. And so I'm curious, you know, like what's your relationship with God, quote unquote, God now, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, it, you're opening your voice and you're letting mm-hmm. that speak through you with the sissy. So tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah. So the ancestral thing is really interesting too. And, um, I have had a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of trauma in our family. There's been familial, um, wounds that have passed down from been passed down from generation to generation, um, on both sides, but in particular on my dad's side, And the ancestral healing goes, uh, you know, into the past and it goes into the future. And Mm -hmm. so I've been um, actually planning on doing a psychedelic journey um, with my daughter, my 25 year old daughter. um, And we're going to start working on some of that healing that um, is, you know, for our generations going forward. And then there's also, um, you know, work to do for healing the trauma that's from the past that, you know, that I both inherited and, and, you know, perpetuated. And so, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of work to be done. I saw, uh, I heard a quote recently that I, I really liked, and I don't know who the author is, but it said, it's, it's, uh, it wasn't your fault, but it is your turn. Uh, Wow. It isn't your fault, but it is your turn. Yeah. So, uh, so Sisu journey, um, that is, it is both a, um, a podcast and it is also, you know, um, a pursuit of helping people learn what I wish I had known about the nervous system and how to regulate it and how to work with your, um, physical body and your brain, um, in healing all kinds of trauma, including, um, the trauma that we've seen perpetuated in the world um, in the last year and a half or so, even more than that, really. I mean, since 2000, 2016, we've been in kind of a, a perpetual trauma cycle. Um, yeah, collectively. At here, it, yeah, here in the U.S. and then also uh, on a global scale. And, and like you've mentioned before, um, it's not just that, it's also our separate separatedness. It's, you know, our, our disconnection from, from the earth and from where we came and from, you know, our people and all of that. So um, we're, we're really seeing, I think, a community of tra- traumatized people. And as a society, we're not doing very well to provide them answers. Our medical system is not giving them what they need. Um, to deal with it. And so I, I'm really just trying to create a resource for folks to find that are, you know, looking for some ways to add some of this ritual and some of these things and figure out how to listen to their own intuition and figure out how to really be at peace and befriend their own nervous system. Um, 
how to understand it, how to move with resilience between these these um, these spaces, and and how to how to stop using substances that stress their body um, in order to try to regulate that. So the first thing that's coming out is the podcast in a few weeks um, or in a couple weeks here. Um, Josie will be episode numero uno. Well, actually number two after after my solo record. Yay. And then, um, and so that's gonna drop. I'm really excited. The I've done three interviews so far and they've all been amazing. Um, and then I'm also going to be launching a course uh, or I guess it's just a program to help people who have you know, kind of want to push the reset button on their COVID drinking and yeah. really learn how to regulate their nervous system. I think we really did a disservice to people by um, encouraging them to day drink when the pandemic started and, and just, you know, passing around all the memes and, and stuff instead of really focusing on people's mental health and fitness. And, um, yeah, and we are seeing numbers, you know, crisis level numbers on those and they're not going anywhere. And there's so many people who are struggling and lonely and are really in a bad space right now. Yeah. Yeah. Alcohol, opioids. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. golly, it just yeah. has become normalized when yeah. Here it is, this fear-based, wear a mask, save lives. You're like, wait a minute, what about all of this? Yes. But it, but it comes from, it has to come from an educational standpoint. Right. So I really honor you and commend you for putting your story out there, but then also bringing such a resource mm -hmm. of education to people yeah. because people don't know the difference between stress, stressor, and what, what the hell is yeah. the stress mm -hmm. cycle? And that- yeah these loops can be open in our being in our nervous system for years, decades. And we see it physically, if not immediately, you know, it will be a chronic situation. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And we're not even um, prepared to really deal with that. Like our, our medical system is already taxed enough. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know that you love Gaber Mate and so do I. And I was listening to him talk and he was talking about how he realized that so many of his patients' physical problems were related to their nervous system dysregulation. Yeah. And furthermore, he, he was in Canada. So everything there was, you know, all their healthcare was free, but they couldn't get access to therapists for free. So he ended up creating a therapy clinic in his medical clinic to see his patients so that they could get this care that their nervous system needed so that their autoimmune disease or whatever they were dealing with that was the result of this stressed taxed nervous system could be healed. Smart of him to find that loop, but God, it's just why, why, why are we, why do we have to do that to people? Yeah, in 2008, um, which if you can think about my timeline was a very stressful time in my life, I ended yeah. up in the hospital and I had tachycardia. And tachycardia is just a very fast heart rate. Mm -hmm. And it they couldn't get it to slow down and they couldn't find any. They did all the scans. There's nothing wrong with me. I was not having heart attack. Um, and they kept me overnight. You know, they... I would go to sleep. My heart rate wouldn't go down Well, I was working in financial services at the time and the economy like collapsed in 2007 and 2008. And so I was watching, I was dealing with my clients who had, were losing money and I was feeling responsible and I was getting divorced and I had $0 to my name. I mean, it was, and I was trying to raise, you know, four kids. It's a cluster. It was, it was a total clusterfuck. And now looking back on it, I'm like, they, they could have taught me to meditate. Right they could the have taught me. Yeah. I mean, they mentioned stress, but the way that they mentioned it, it was almost like saying it's in your head. You know what I mean? Mm. Where it, they didn't say like stress is a very powerful <laughs> tax on your nervous system. And that could very much be causing this problem. And these, yes. here are some tools and techniques to like stop watching the fucking stock ticker for one thing like that would be a good that would have been a good advice in itself 
Yeah. Stress is not psychological. Stress is a physiological mm-hmm. thing right. that we, it's so physiological. We can, right. we cannot escape mm-hmm. it. Yeah. There's physical stress, there's chemical stress and there's env- or, um, emotional stress and they all yeah. actually are like impacting, you know, they actually impact the physical body. It's not like yes. you, um, you just imagine it. Well, it's our society is full sick. We are, um, one of my favorite books is civilized to death. You know, we are civilized to death. We do not have all the support systems to relieve this sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, creating that sort of community through podcasts like yours Mm -hmm. that will be live very, very soon. Yeah. Uh, And, uh, you know, offering an educational, um, course where mm-hmm. people can actually learn about this yeah. because nobody's bringing the information to them. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious in like, what, what main ways have you recognized your health change other than feeling a little bit more of that embodiment and, um, yeah, just yeah. groundedness. How has your actual physical health changed? Oh my goodness. So I used to have insomnia. I would have trouble falling asleep and staying asleep that mm is a thing of the past. Once in a while I wake up at night and it's a little bit hard for me to fall back to sleep or I get, you know, my cortisol going and I usually end up watch listening to a hypnosis or meditation and falling back to sleep. Um, I used to have terrible like gastrointestinal complications. Um, they're not fully repaired, but I, I also did use a, I, I, went through a functional medicine um, person to help me kind of really get to the bottom of my hormonal and my physical challenges that I was having in addition to working on my emotional stuff. Um, I have a lot more energy. I have a lot more, um, my brain is um, much more, you know, turned on, I guess. I I just am, am very much more connected with in all of my relationships with myself and with others, I just feel, um, you know, I feel good every day. <laughs> that's, that's, that's uh, possible. <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah. I wake up and I am excited to, for the day and I have energy and I have mental energy and I, um, yeah. I mean, I'm working full-time job and I'm also starting this business. So actually I wanted to, um, one thing I forgot to mention is to why the, what, why the name of the podcast and why I'm kind of yes, coming from thank that you. So Sisu is a Finnish word. So kind of full circle back to the Finnish. Um, it is a word that means um, roughly translated extreme resilience in the face of um, adversity. So the Finnish people have had a lot of adversity, they're a very resilient and powerful nation. But um, one thing that I've realized for my own self that I can develop this resilience through these practices. So that's why it's, you know, it's a journey and we're all somewhere on it. But like I said, we're all students and we're all teachers and we're all just doing our best. Um, And then science and stories of resilience. So science, of course, very important to me. I'm an engineer. so I really like to know um, what works and why things work. Um, and so I really want to poke some modalities and see if I, you know, if, if there's science behind them, um, then I want to share that, you know, with listeners. And then stories of resilience. Really, I'm interested in hearing anyone's stories that have, have um, worked to overcome some type mm-hmm. of adversity because stories are really what change our hearts and minds. You know, that's really what has made the impact on all of the gay rights legislation and all that stuff is that people started to know people who were gay. They were their sons or daughters or whatever. And they realized that, you know, they're just like us. They're, they just uh, happen to be born, you know, with a different propensity. And so then you learn and and you grow through hearing other people's stories. Yeah. And just part of, part of our culture is that, um, most of the storytelling, normally we'd be around a campfire and we'd have a village storyteller, or we would tell one another stories, Mm -hmm. but instead we, we have this very centralized 
narrative. We don't see ourselves represented. We don't see um, our likeness. That's and great. so it's, it, it's this feedback loop of like, there's something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. I don't fit into this. I'm missing. It's, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. There's something wrong with me. Yeah. It's, it's a fucked up thing, but um, it is the stories do change our hearts mm-hmm. and they change our minds. And I think, you know, people, are given information. And as you know, this is so, such a central part of your journey is going from the head to the heart, which is the mm-hmm. longest journey most anybody will take. Mm-hmm. And, but you can have the data, you can have the information, but it's not going to impact you until you have that heartfelt, you know, um, experience of, of, of recognizing the humanity behind uh, some of what it is that we're talking about you know, like breaking these cycles of, of trauma and the stress on our neuro or, you know, our, on our nervous system and how that, how we can actually change our, our physiology. I think a lot of people get stuck in, um, in that, that understand, or they, they find themselves in this rhythm of life and they just think it's normal. You know, Mm -hmm. so many people, older people who just go, well, this is how it is. Mm Mm-hmm. Instead so always of like, how we've done it. Yes. Always how we've done it is how my body has always felt, um, you know, b- being a budding massage therapist and just getting to lay hands on people. It's really interesting. People just, Oh, I didn't know that hurt. You know, yeah. I, I didn't know. Oh my gosh. I didn't know that was so sore, you know, yeah. and you just recognize how disconnected people are from their mm-hmm. bodies. Um, it's really astounding. Yeah. And circling back to you, what you said about epigenetics, um, you know, you don't have to wait until you, till a baby's born to change your genetic expression. You can do that daily by changing your story. Yes. Oh my God. That's going to be my clip right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's golden. Um, well, as we're wrapping up, I'm kind of curious, um, with your, with your project, who is your dream interviewee? Oh, well, that's a good one. Yeah. Let's put it out into the universe. Let's call it in sister. Come on. Well, I mean, I was just reading untamed yesterday to a friend and I was, I mean, Glennon Doyle, I'll take her, I'll take her wife as well. She's amazing. I've listened to her talk. Um, yeah, I mean, Brene Brown would also be pretty great. What about Oprah? Like, she's pretty kick ass, you know? Oh my gosh. Yes. It's a pretty good short list. Yeah. Top three. <laughs> that was that was easy. Oh my God. Let's just take them all out for lunch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when restaurants open up again. That's the thing, though, is like, I'm like, oh, I should ask, I should see if I could get, you know, so and so and so and so. And then I'm like, nope. They each have their own stories. I want them one at a time. Yes, absolutely. But yeah, just to be in that, um, that energy space, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm, I'm kind of curious, uh, you've mentioned so many books and in our previous conversations, there's been Mm -hmm. so many book recommendations Mm -hmm. going back and forth. My audible, uh, wish list has grown exponentially. Uh, I'm curious, what are some books that you would recommend to listeners? Like if they're starting out yeah. on this journey, um, what are some books that, that would get them started in the right direction? So this book is called Polyvagal Exercises for Safety and Connection. And it's by Deb Dana. Oh, she's another person I'd like to interview as well. Um, this is a really excellent book. I mean, and and really anything on the polyvagal theory. She has a flip chart and stuff like that of just learning about the parts of your nervous system and being able to do exercises to get yourself in your body. The body keeps the score is amazing. I mean, anyone that wants to get more familiar with how body and, you know, the body is affected by trauma and, um, and kind of what to do about it and, and, and just a deep dive into all of that. Um, is amazing. This Naked Mind is a great book for anyone who just wants to know more and understand more about their relationship with alcohol. Um, That's by Annie Grace. There's also Quit Like a Woman, 
um, which it was a, a really great book for anyone who is kind of more left leaning and isn't afraid of a few, you know, what a little bit of language sprinkled here and there. Um, yeah, I think, let me see what else I've got here. Those are kind of my top ones. I am planning on having some book um, recommendations available on my website. So once it's up and running, I will send you that link and, um, and hopefully um, folks can find some interesting information and in some of the stuff that I've read. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think um, with as much as, as much as you have read and how uh, just how diverse all the topics are, you know, a little bit of everything, mm -hmm. you know, from psychedelics to polyvagal to mm -hmm. understanding addiction and alcoholism and things mm -hmm. in that, that nature, you should have a book study. <laughs> oh yeah. And um, how to change your mind is an excellent book about psychedelics and research. Michael Pollan. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a good, that's a good bridge book. I mean, Mm -hmm. for anybody it's it, it gives the information but then just the fact that he's such a um such a uh uh what's the term I'm looking for he just is a journalist who dives in mm -hmm. he was a, he's a well-renowned researcher um and has done some really great work uh, prior to his, his exploration of psychedelics so he had a lot of um solid reputation in the community yep to bring to yeah. the table with that book. I mean, I think another one of his books was um, one of Oprah's book of the month club. Oh, really? We should have a Helena book of the, of, of the month club. <laughs> Could you I start bet. that? Yes. <laughs> hey, I'll sign up for that. Absolutely. <laughs> I love, I love book clubs. I'm, I'm part of one of them yeah. with the, another podcast and cool. it feels so good just to read and be able to mm -hmm. have some dialogue about this and not be the only person mm -hmm. just like in yeah. this space. So my sisters and I are going through the artist's way as well. I mentioned that one earlier. Um, mm -hmm. That's a really good book for anyone who feels blocked in any way, because it just, everyone is a creative. And um, even if you don't feel like it, you're an artist of some kind. And so figuring out all of those messages that we got early on, and that went into our subconscious about why we can't be a creative or why our creative expression isn't welcome in the world. That's a pursuit worth having as well. Yeah. It encourages to be unedited, you know, with mm -hmm. those morning pages to really see mm -hmm. what is there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a good one for anybody like me, <laughs> who, when I write something, I want to, Oh, did I smell that? Right. Let me look, hold on. I'm going to mm -hmm. look it up. Did I smell that? <laughs> well, yeah. is that a period or should I do a comma? Like you just Semicolon. over, <laughs> yeah. You overthink yourself and you know, and then you get to your deathbed and you realize I wasted my fucking life, this precious yeah. fucking life. Yeah. And why, and why would we have to why would we have to have all these barriers to our own creative expression? Like who, who gains from that? Oof. It's a million dollar question. Oh my gosh. I think that's a, maybe a good place to end. Is there anything that you want to leave the listeners with that I haven't covered or anything that you might want to tell somebody at the start of their, their journey? You know, I recently heard an interview from Glennon Doyle and she was talking about how she didn't know how to sit with her emotions. And then she was just like, later on, I realized all you do is wait, that's it. And it's so true, like emotions are just passing through you. They're not part of you. You don't, you're not anxious. You are feeling anxiety or experiencing anxiety. So if you just wait and don't interrupt it by doing something or taking something, it'll pass. Mm. God, that is so important. Such a, <laughs> such a distinction, you know, especially in our society of shame, 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 yeah. you are this instead mm -hmm. of no, 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 you are a precious human being and you're experiencing X, mm -hmm. Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. And it's uncomfortable. 
Yeah. But it's not going to last forever. Hmm. You are magic. I am so honored and so, so grateful for Mary Jane to introduce us, but also yeah. so, so grateful to be able to call you a friend and yeah. a kind of a colleague now in this space. Yes. You know, I'm excited Yay. to see what's to come. I hope Me you get too. all of those ladies on your podcast. Yep. Are you listening? Perfect. I know, right? <laughs> we'll have to send it to them. Right. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thanks, Josie. Thank you. We'll, we'll talk, chat again soon. Okay. Thank you so much for listening to the Cease Journey podcast. We know finding a good therapist may be one of the hardest things you'll ever do. If you or someone you know is looking for a therapist, we've created a PDF download available just for you. The link to the guide is in the show notes, and it can also be found at sisujourney.com. We're also hosting an immersive, interactive online workshop from 9 to noon Pacific, April 10th, called Transform Your Abusive Relationship with Alcohol into a Mindful One. And it is especially for folks who want to support with their pandemic drinking getting a little out of control. Unfortunately, we told a traumatized people to regulate their nervous system with alcohol and some of us are paying a high price. During the workshop, you'll receive tools to shift the story of you to be based on the future instead of the past, navigate the landscape of your nervous system so you'll always find your way home, learn how to use EFT tapping to deal with cravings and nervous system dysregulation, create a powerful resource anchor for when you are vulnerable, discover the expansive variety of resources and healing paths available as alternatives to rigid conventional treatment options, leverage the power of your unconscious mind to support your healing and growth. Podcast listeners get $20 off of the regular cost of admission, which is $49, so $29 ticket sale using the promo code podcast 10% of the profits from all ticket sales will be donated to the Loveland Foundation, a nonprofit which provides therapy to Black women and girls. Go to cisujourney.com slash events to sign up. Don't forget to use the promo code podcast for your discount. We look forward to sharing more stories with you next Monday. We will also periodically be dropping resource episodes on Fridays, so stay tuned. The theme music is Syrian Rue, which is written and performed by the Mood Doculators. For more of their music and to listen for free, visit mooddocs.com.